Yeah. Good evening and welcome to the webinar. Today we have Sarah Gage speaking with us on identifying native plants. Sarah Gage is a botanist, a blogger, and a writer with the Washington Native Plant Society. Sarah remembers identifying her first plant, a bean, at age six. Since then, she's botanized extensively in the Pacific Coast states and in Far Eastern Russia. She managed the University of Washington Herbarium for 13 years and then worked on biodiversity conservation and salmon recovery in the state government. Sarah is a past president of Washington Native Plant Society and now serves on several WMPS committees as well as serves as the curator for the Botanical Rambles blog on the WMPS website. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Sarah Gage. On a side note, well, thank you. On one side note, you will not see Sarah uh, speaking with image today as she is on a telephone line to connect. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Denise, for that, that kind introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Sarah Gage, and I'm speaking to you tonight from my home in Seattle, Washington. And I'd like to acknowledge that my house sits on unceded ancestral land of the Duwamish people, who were the first people of Seattle. And I honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish people, past and present. Now, I know some of you who are listening in tonight don't need any of my help with plant identification because you are experts in your own right. Um, and uh, there are a lot of ways to approach the subject of plant identification. And in this talk, I've taken the approach of teaching you to fish as opposed to giving you a fish. So it's not a show of plants themselves. It's a show rather of tools that I have used and that have been helpful to me. So tonight, I'm going to go over um, some fundamental questions associated with plant identification, some types of equipment that will make your life easier, a little bit about how plants are classified and how to approach plant names, different types of resources for, uh, available for learning about identifying plants, and some approaches or strategies for learning about them. And then I think we'll have uh, time to take your questions at the end. And as, um, as you may be familiar with these uh, webinars, uh, you'll feel free to type your question into the chat or the Q&A box as we go along. But I plan to plow through ahead and take questions at the end. So one fundamental question is why identify plants? And I encourage you to set your intention. What is your particular goal or purpose for identifying plants? I think a lot of us, you know, it's one of our verbal, earliest verbal impulses is to name. So we name our mother, father, mama, dada. We want to satisfy curiosity. What is that? And we want to be able to talk or write or look up information about a plant. Is it edible? We want to be able to use it in the garden or use it in some other way. And then, you know, if you're coming into a place, you want to be able to know what you have on that place. And um, know all sorts of stuff about it. Of course, it's frustrating. It isn't easy. As Georgia O'Keeffe said, you know, uh, nobody sees a flower, really. It is so small. It takes time. We haven't time. And to see takes time, like to have a friend takes time. And in addition to the time involved, plants vary quite a bit. They might grow and look differently in different places. Um, they might be different at different times of the year. Um, growing conditions, less water, more water, shady, sunny, different soil conditions, all those can conspire to make a plant look different in different places. And their parts are small, or they can be very small. And then I just also want to note that it's easier for some people than for others. Um, it's always been relatively easy for me. Um, but I sympathize for, with people for whom it's not easy because I've taken classes in geology. I've gone on geological field trips and I have a hard time remembering the names of rocks, the names of landmarks, and it doesn't stick. I have to sort of relearn it every time. 
And like most scientific fields or endeavors, there's a specialized technical language. So it takes time and practice like any skill, like any new language. But there are some things that can help. And it's a great excuse to buy new gadgets if you don't have any of these. And as the cartoon man says, all my gadgets are old, like some new gadgets. So first off, of course, it really helps to have visual aids. And these are a variety of things that I've accumulated. I won't say collected. They seem to have come to me in various stages of my life. This one here is my very first hand lens that I bought when I was in high school. It's a 17 times magnification, which I have to say is a little bit big. The, the area that's in focus is very, very tiny in the middle. So I wouldn't recommend getting one that's quite so high magnification. This is the one I probably use the most because it's nice and big. It's uh, eight times magnification. And I was just given this one recently. It's 10 times magnification. If you don't have a hand lens and you can't figure out where to buy one and you don't want to, you can always use a magnifying glass. And these are a variety of things that I've accumulated. Some of them have lights. Lights can be very ha handy. This one came, I think, with a dictionary. And, you know, so you can just use what you have on hand. And then I was out once with uh, Doug Benalil, who wrote a, a very well-known foraging book of plants of the Northwest. And he actually just used a really strong pair of reading glasses when he was out. And he would hang it over one ear and sort of flip it up to his eyes when he was looking at something. A lot of times people don't recognize that if they're out bird watching, say, they can flip around their binoculars and look at them with the eyepiece, or that is, put the, the non-eyepiece end up to your eye, look through it, and you can get some magnification of a plant that way. And this is a little dissecting scope that I picked up along the way, and it's really nice because then it's a stable thing. You can look at it, the lights uh, incorporated. If you want to do any dissection, you can do that right on the stage. And this has a 1x magnification here and 10x here. And then you can also flip this so it has two times. So ultimately, you can get a 20 times magnification. So that can be handy if you get really serious about it. I mentioned a dissecting kit. Here's some of the things that I've found helpful. So a couple of straight edge razors, um, which are never as sharp as you want them to be, but sometimes for uh, dissecting or, or taking a cross section, that can be very useful. A variety of needles for teasing things apart, some uh, fine tip forceps. And I, I suggest from years of experience that you just go ahead and buy two of them because you're gonna drop the first pair on its noses and bend those little tips almost immediately. So if you buy two, then at least you'll have one in reserve for a second one to blunt. And then it's good to have a ruler. You want centimeters and millimeters. Um, in this one, I've punched a hole and put it on a string so I can tie it around my neck. But for years, I just carried a little piece of a ruler so I had something with me um, to measure. Here's a picture of me about 25 years ago. I was all kitted up doing some collecting in the Russian Far East. And I was doing uh, plant collecting, but I had my, uh, you can't quite see it, but I had my, my hand lens around my neck, my ruler. Um, I think my binoculars are down in my jacket. And also I have a camera. At this point, I often wish that I had two heads or at least another neck that I could hang some stuff off of. Um, I think the, my GPS unit was here. And then I had some clippers and uh, a hoary, hoary digging knife at my belt along with a small container of small bags and a big container of big bags. And as you can see, it was pretty rainy. I was wearing waders. Um, this uh, hori hori looks like a big knife. And at one point, the, the Russian doctor on the research vessel sidled up to me and he said, Sara, why do you have such big knife? So I felt pretty tough after that. Let's talk a little bit about plant classification and nomenclature. Um, many of you will remember this from your basic biology classes. In botany, we learned King David came over for golf sticks. So kingdom, division, class, order, family, genus, species. If you studied basic biology or zoology, you might have learned King Philip came over for golf sticks or King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Same idea, the zoologists used 
division, in, I mean, the botanists use division instead of phylum, which is what the um, zoologists use. Look in the page here on the notes. So here's how that breaks down for a particular plant. Um, we're in the domain eukarya, which means that they have a, a true nucleus, that is a membrane enclosed organelle that contains their uh, genetic material, the DNA and so forth. Um, we're in the plant kingdom, the subkingdom of vascular plants. Vascular in this case means that it's a plant with plumbing. That is, it's got that xylem and phloem you may have learned about in basic biology. Here we're talking about a seed plant, so that's in, in uh, contrast with a spore plant. And a seed, my uh, old colleague and professor Ed Haskins once told me, was a seed is a baby plant in a box with a lunch. And it's uh, that baby plant, the embryo plant in a box, a seed coat, and the lunch is either the endosperm or the cotyledons that, um, that help the, the embryo grow. We're talking in this case about a flowering plant as opposed to a non-flowering plant or a gymnosperm or cone-bearing plant. Um, we're talking about a dicotyledon, and we'll talk a little bit more about cotyledons in a second. Subclass Magnoliaidae, order Ranunculales, and then the family Berberidaceae, genus Mahonia, species Mahonia nervosa. We'll talk a little bit more about these three levels in just a second. In this case, uh, the common name of this plant is the Cascade Oregon grape, also sometimes known as the low Oregon grape, or I think some people even call it the dull Oregon grape. So here we are in my garden looking at some cotyledons. I just wanted to refresh your memory on what they, these are. So <clears throat> when a monocotyledonous plant, plant comes up, it just has a single seed leaf. And so that's that monocotyledon, single seed leaf. And here are my leeks coming up in my raised bed. And that's an example of a monocotyledon. Here's a dicotyledon. And in this case, it's my radishes coming up. And you can see I, I sow a little too thickly. It's a, it's a bad habit I have. But anyway, we have two seed leaves here in the radishes. And uh, the dicotyledons, that's how I first identified my first plant, that bean, back when I was in first grade. We were living in Illinois at the time. And in uh, my first like, grade class, we planted beans in Dixie cups. And they came up and they had those first two leaves, the, the dicot dicotyledons of the, um, of the bean plant and then the new true leaf that had just started coming up. And it was uh, late in the spring in Illinois and things were just really uh, verdant and coming along. And so my family went out to visit a, another family for dinner one night and we were um, playing in the backyard, which uh, bordered onto a farm field. And I went out there and what do you know, that farm field was full of beans just like the bean that I had planted in my Dixie cup. So that was my very first plant identification. I'm gonna go back to this, these three levels of plant classification and nomenclature. So some tricks, of course, the Berberidaceae is the name of this particular family, and all the plant families end in this suffix, A-C-E. A-C-E, that's the plant family suffix. The next level is the genus or generic name, in this case, Mahonia, named after an early American uh, actual shopkeeper, McMahon. And uh, he was, uh, it, it was honored by the botanist Thomas Nuttall. And um, then the species name is Mahonia nervosa. In this case, remember, well, actually, in all cases, uh, the species name of a plant is both the genus and what's known as the specific epithet. In this case, nervosa, referring to the nerves on the leaves that look, um, that are kind of networky and, and easily visible. So nut, in this case, refers to Thomas Nuttall. Uh, Persh refers to Frederick Persh. Um, and uh, we won't talk much more about the name, these particular naming conventions. 
But suffice it to say that metal and Kirsch had um, a lot to do with the naming of, in this case, the genus, and in this case, the combination of pneumonia nervosa. And just be aware that um, the um, uh, specific epithet, nervosa, is not sufficient to name this particular plant. Another example in our flora is uh, the specific epithet rotundifolia, which means round leaves. For example, we have a bluebell, campanula rotundifolia, and a sundew, drosser rotundifolia. So if you were just to say something, oh, that's rotundifolia, without giving it that qualifier of the generic name, people wouldn't know which, which species you were actually talking about. The rules are dictated um, in this International Code for nomenc of Nomenclature, and this most recent one was done in 2018 at an international convention. Um, one of the biggest uh, misconceptions I think I've heard in my years of doing botany is that there's like some body that, help, that dictates the classification, the infamous they. Well, there is a body that um, dictates the conventions of naming, but there's not a body that dictates uh, classification. And there can be a lot of differing opinions about classification based on different data sets and interpretations. So I think that's important to remember that no one body makes a decision on classification although there are rules about how things um, are named. There have been massive shifts in the last 30 years um, from evidence from molecular sequences and sophisticated new analyses that are really changing our understanding about how plants evolved and are related. So you may hear a lot of groaning, uh, especially when we talk about the new flora that's out in our, from our region, about old name and new name. But, um, and I'm certainly one of those people who's a little uh, disgruntled about all the name changes, but really it's a good thing. We're learning more about how life on Earth evolved and our names are helping us um, reflect that knowledge. Now, why don't we rely on common names? Sometimes it can seem like a common name is more stable than a scientific name. And that's true perhaps if you're working in a very small area with a, in a very small geographical area. But um, one plant is likely to have many different common names worldwide in different parts of the country even, and of course in different languages. And the same common name may apply to several plants. A common name might be charming or it might be offensive. And they don't have any international rules governing them. On the left here, we see Caminarion angustifolia, folium, um, formerly Epilobium angustifolium, and it's commonly known in our area as fireweed. But in Canada, I understand that they refer to it as great willow herb, and I've heard people in uh, the Great Britain refer to it as rose bay willow herb. But we, we, I think you can agree it's not a rose, it's not a bay or laurel, and it's not a willow, it's not a, a, a salix. So, and neither of course is it fire, although it does have the reputation of coming into an area after a fire. So uh, to be most accurate, you'd want to refer to it by its scientific name. And uh, this one, Artemisia ludovisiana subspecies lindiana, um, a common, common names for this might include silver wormwood, western mugwort, white sagebrush, gray sagewort. And of course, sage, culinary sage, is a completely different genus, the genus salvia. You can see that if someone was referring just to sage and you went out and plucked this, you might be at risk of, of introducing a, a toxic plant into your, um, or at least a, a non-tasty plant possibly toxic into your into the dish that you're cooking. And uh, while we're on this subject, I would just say that when I was teaching a course once with Dr. Art Krukeberg, um, who's well known in our area, um, up at the Edmonds Community College, he made quite a quite an announcement, really was quite stern about this, that these um, these scientific names are just that, scientific names. They're not Latin names. Um, because they come from many different roots and sources. You might correctly refer to them as Latinized names, 
but many of them have Greek roots or roots from other languages. They might be names. And so he felt quite strongly that we should refer to them as scientific names, not Latin names. People also push back and say that scientific names are just too hard. And I want to push back and say that, well, many people talk about rhododendrons with no problem at all. Similarly, they talk about geraniums or chrysanthemums. So it's really just a matter of what you're used to. And um, you can also find resources that so the, the roots of the name may become old friends. So in this case, rhodo means red, dendron means tree, macro means big, phylum, in this case it's phylum because it has two L's, not one. So that refers to leaf. So we have the red tree with the big leaves. Similarly with geranium, geranos is, uh, I think it's Latin, I can't remember. Anyway, it comes from the word crane and it refers to this crane-like beak of the of the um of the fruit and just a side note fruit in botanical terms doesn't mean a juicy apple or orange necessarily it's any seed bearing structure that derives from the ripened ovary of the flower so it has a, a, a bird-like beak fruit and then it's viscosissimum so it's kind of sticky viscose and then the leaves, this, this variety has very incised leaves, lots of uh, an appearance of being cut. So there must be a variety perhaps that doesn't have such incised leaves. And I want to tell you a little story. Um, so even with all the best intentions in the world, there can be confusions. Again, when I was collecting in uh, Far Eastern Russia, one of my colleagues, Arkady, who was an entomologist, um, we were walking through this area and I came across this incredible tree and it had this amazing corky bark, yellow corky bark and these divided leaves. It was just a gorgeous thing. And I didn't have any idea what it was. Um, and Arkady told me that it was philodendron. And I was going, whoa, you know, I'm sorry, Arkady. I, you know, I just don't believe you that this is a philodendron. Well, what he was actually saying was philodendron, not philodendron. And this is a, a, a tree that grows in Russian Far East, at philodendron amurensis. I, of course, was thinking of philodendron, a common, common house plant. Another thing that's, that people get uh, uptight about is pronunciation and you know so it's all about communicating and as you can see even with the best will in the world like I said Arkady and I had difficulty communicating even when we were talking about scientific names but eventually we got it sorted out so forge ahead do your best generally you want to pronounce every syllable in a scientific name um, there's some resources out there. Um, this is the new pronouncing dictionary of plant names. Mine came out, I think, um, in the 60s. And um, uh, but I think there was a more recent one um, published in, say, in 2014, I think it was. But this is one that I got from my mom. And then also in the American Gardener, the magazine of the American Horticultural Society, in every issue, they have pronunciations along with hardiness zones of all of the plants that they treat in the bat, in that issue of the magazine. So that's another source. One other issue with plant names is that sometimes they're just considered too highfalutin. And um, it's always a case that you want to judge your audience, gauge your audience, and see, you know, what are they going to be most receptive to when you're talking with other plant nerds, well, you probably want to use a scientific name. But if you're just talking to your family, you know, maybe a common name will suffice. And maybe use both. That's always a good, a good um, option as well. So some, here are some ways to learn the names of plants. Here's an example of how not to remember names. Um, the brilliant Roz Chast cartoon, and she goes, okay, he has a button nose. That rhymes with Sutton, Willie Sutton, Willie Sutton Rob Banks. Banks rhymes with Hanks, Tom Hanks. His name is Tom. No, no, his name is Hank. 
No, Tom. Hank? Wait, Hank. Sounds weird. I've got it. It must be Frank. No, it's not Frank. So you need to find a method, but you need to find one that works. So here are some examples how to learn the name of plants. One of them would be to ask someone who knows. So for example, when we're not social distancing, you can go on field trips. In this case, um, you might go with the Washington Native Plant Society, the Mountaineers has a nature study group. Lots of organizations offer field trips and um, are oftentimes doing some kind of nature study, including the plants. Now, I will confess that oftentimes um, plant nerds are, you know, are kind of slow, and it may take as long to get out of the parking lot as, as the rest of the hike itself. Um, I will say, however, in our defense, that we're not as slow as birders, and we don't have to stand as still for as long as the birders do. I have stood in the cold and in the rain with people who are birding, and those folks just do not budge. Um, and then the other thing, of course, with plants is that you don't have to worry about uh, scaring them away. So you can talk as loudly as you want, you can dance, um, and um, the plants aren't going to go anywhere. Um, when, uh, again, when we're not social distancing, uh, many, or many counties have a master gardener clinics where you can go and ask someone there and they will help you figure out how to find out the name of that plant. If you go to a park and they're having ranger-led walks, a ranger is a great resource and will help you um, find uh, out the name of the plant. Similarly, many parks have a, a visitor center where they have a resources where you can figure out what, what plants you're seeing. Many arboreta or parks have docent-led walks. Um, that can be another great opportunity. I know uh, lately on the Washington Native Plant Society Facebook page, a lot of people have been um, posting photographs and uh, asking for help with identification. And oftentimes you can identify, especially a common plant, with a photograph. Oftentimes you can't because uh, you need some feature that's not visible on the photograph. But so, um, but the people have been getting a lot of, of names um, bandied about on the WNPS Facebook page, the public group. And then similarly, um, actually this is a great resource, the Plant Answer Line. This is at the Center for Urban Horticulture at the Elizabeth uh, Miller Library. You can submit a question on many different topics, um, including plant identification. Uh, they, you can uh, call them, uh, they have a phone number listed, uh, you can also send them an email, or they also have an online form. Um, I'm not putting uh, uh, URLs or uh, links on this uh, slideshow, but any of these things you can easily Google and find them. Another way to learn the names of plants is to use a field guide. And this is a sort of random assortment of field guides that I've collected over the years. I kind of stopped buying them a few years ago, well, actually several years ago. And so I'm, I'm pretty out of date. There's some other really great ones that have come out recently. Um, but um, you need to find a guide that works for you. And so some things to consider are, how is the guide organized? Um, there's many different types of organizations. So they might be organized by growth form, by flower color, by flower shape and size. Um, sometimes there'll be books for a particular habitat, or this is more of a pamphlet really, uh, different geography. So plants of the Pacific Northwest Coast, for example, is gonna be a lot more specific and detailed than this one, my first one, the field guide for Pacific States wildflowers, um, which covers Oregon, Washington, Oregon, Washington, and California. If you're really concentrating on a particular area, it's nice to have a field guide that really focuses on that area. Um, and some of them are just charming. This is an old one from a guy named C.J. Lyons, and it has really charming little drawings. Another thing to think about is whether you relate better to a photograph or a drawing or some combination. So this has paintings and drawings. This one, I think, has primarily photographs. This one, Pojar and McKinnon, Plants of the Pacific Northwest Coast, has both, I think. The geography or habitat that you're interested in is important. Um, and 
you know, you can browse in a library or in a bookstore or online and find one that works for you. Also ask people, um, you know, if, if, or you'll see one on a field trip, uh, which one people, a lot of people are using. Some websites can be very helpful. Um, this is one I use a lot, the Burke Herbarian Image Collection. Um, and it has uh, photographs from many different um, uh, people that have been collected here and um, along with uh, critical information about each species or variety. So where, where it's found, um, a basic description with leaves and flower characteristics and time of blooming. Um, and then uh, some beautiful photographs. And many people have taken great care with their photographs, in some cases, um, uh, taking pictures of, of the plant or the, the flower at different stages. Um, this, her, this website also has a couple of great resources. One is this random access key, the Plants Ident of Washington Identification Key, which is kind of a, um, something you don't actually need a plant name to get started. You can just answer some questions like flowers yellow, uh, pendant, uh, you know, is it a shrub or a tree or an herb, things like that. And then if you really get ambitious and you want to go out in the winter, they have a winter twig identification key that you can use to identify some of those seemingly dead sticks you see out in the woods during the winter. Um, another thing I use quite a bit is the plants database from the USDA. This is a national uh, in scope website and has distribution maps, um, up to date taxonomy, and um, well, relatively up to date, I think, depending on your take on things, and uh, some information about invasiveness and some other really good resources and links to other, other uh, photo libraries and so forth. And then on our own Washington Native Plant Society website, we have the Native Plants Directory, which has information about, especially about um, cultivating plants. So what kinds of conditions they like to grow in and uh, as well as photographs. Another option is to, to use a plant list. The Washington Native Plant Society has an excellent collection of plant lists for Washington State that have been created for a long period of time by many members of the society and other people. Um, and those have recently been uh, uh, databased and digitized so that it's really, a, it's really an interactive resource. And you can get a plant list for a particular hike or a particular area or counties. Um, and uh, Don Schachtel recently gave a webinar on the Native Plant Society plant list, and I uh, encourage you to listen to his webinar because um, he can go into it in a lot more detail than I can tonight. Um, but I like those because you can print them out and take them with you on a hike, or and you can also contribute. You can make your own list. There's a lot of areas in the state that don't have plant lists associated with them. In fact, I was shocked to go to Beacon Rock State Park not long ago. Well, it might have been a couple of years ago, and there was no plant list associated. I thought it'd be so easy. Um, I took some really lousy photographs. And I thought, oh, I'll just go home and get the plant list and see what these are. And uh, whoops, there wasn't a plant list. Dang it all. Um, the Consortium for Pacific Northwest Herbaria is a wonderful resource, too. And David Giblin gave a webinar about the resources on this site not that long ago, especially um, how to access the uh, specimen database. And this is so not just for Washington, but for the entire Pacific Northwest. Um, and so a major difference about any checklist or county list or area list that you might download from this website is that unlike the Native Plant Society plant list, these lists all have specimens associated with them. So that's really the gold standard. When you have a voucher specimen that's associated with um, uh, a, a name on a list. Somewhere in, in one of these herbaria, there's a specimen that really proves that that plant was there and that, um, that it was identified correctly. Um, plant lists are wonderful, wonderful tools. They are, however, of course, only as good as the paper they're written on, or actually the person who put together the list. 
So there can be errors in a plant list here, and there can be errors errors in a voucher specimen as well. But just so so you know that these these lists have um, specimens backing them up. And just to uh, make sure you all know that a herbarium is not just an herb garden. It's actually an herb, a, a library of dried plant specimens. So um, covers the, the wide range of plant material. So let's talk a little bit about apps. I haven't used most of these apps, and so um, you'll need to, to check them out on your own. One I've heard a lot about that was created by um, our uh, Native Plant Society's pal, Mark Turner, his beautiful photographs along with the University of Washington Booth Museum and High Country app. This one costs about $10. You can get it online. And um, I've heard very good things about it, but I haven't used it myself. Similarly, iNaturalist is a crowdsourced site that was recently written up in our journal, Douglasia. Um, and it sounds fun to use, where you submit a photograph and then uh, experts uh, weigh in on, on what that, um, what that plant, or actually they do many different types of organisms, what that critter or plant might be. Picture This is an app that I'm familiar with only because I went on a walk in the Bellevue Botanical Garden recently with a docent, and she was using this, and she was having good luck with taking pictures and getting a match on, um, on the plants that she was interested in. Because as you know, if you go to a botanical garden in an arboretum, chances are that the plants you're most interested in looking at or figuring out what they are, you won't be able to find the label, or at least that's their known experience. Plant Snap is another one that allows you to take a picture and um, it matches it within its database. Um, and I don't know much about that one, but um, and I think there are several others uh, out there, but these are just a few that, that um, I've heard of. Trees of Seattle is a little bit different. It's more like a, a tree walk guide for the city of Seattle uh, in various neighborhoods such as Ballard or Columbia City. Um, there's a, a, a map and some trees highlighted and it gives you information about those trees, what, how tall they grow, um, what kinds of conditions they like, things like that. Um, and that covers both native and introduced or cultivated trees. These last two maps have to do, or apps have to do with um, uh, reporting invasive species. Uh, EDD stands for um, Early Detection and Distribution. It's a mapping system, and we would, uh, the one that's most relevant to our area is EDD West. Um, and this is again for uh, reporting um, invasive plants to land managers and other people. Um, who are trying to get a handle on, um, on the spread, especially of, of new infestations so that they can um, manage them appropriately. The Washington Invasive Species Council has an app which um, focuses on the, on the species that the council has identified as targets, and they collaborate with the EDD system. So um, you can uh, use either, either of these. Um, the Washington Invasive Species Council also has um, um, not just plants, but has animals and um, including mussels and um, uh, feral pigs and other things like that. So this is just a, the tip of the iceberg on apps, and I encourage you to explore them, find one that works for you, um, and uh, or you can run with the big dogs, and or I should say, and use to learn to use the flora for your area. This is an image of the flora of the Pacific Northwest second edition, uh, which came out in 2018. And um, the original, Leo, uh, C. Leo Hitchcock and Arthur Cronquist. So this book is frequently returned to, referred to as Hitchcock and Cronquist, or Hitchcock, or even just Hitchy. And thanks to these folks, uh, David Giblin, Ben Legler, Peter Zika, Richard Olmsted, and their cast of supporting illustrators, it's just a marvelous achievement that we have this up-to-date flora for our area. Um, also online is the Washington Checklist, and that is, uh, has um, up-to-date nomenclature for our area. And the Flora of the Pacific Northwest also has an online presence 
so errors and updates and new information are being posted um, there. So it's a, a remaining a living, uh, breathing document. So the best to learn this, to use this book, unfortunately, is to take some kind of a course. Um, the University of Washington, for example, offers a quarter-long co course on plant identification and classification, as do many of the community colleges throughout the state, as well as the other universities in the state. Um, the Washington Native Plant Society and other organizations oftentimes offer short courses or workshops. Um, so with persistence, you can find, a, find a, a, a venue to walk you through really learning how to use this. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple of minutes. I want to give just a little bit of the background. So this was the original uh, one volume Flora of the Pacific Northwest, which came out in this rather unfortunate week uh, binding. So ultimately, thanks to Scott Moore and some other people with the Native Plant Society, a bunch of us got ours rebound so that it was much easier to take it in the field without shedding bits of it um, as you did that. This one volume was derived from the five volume Vascular Plants of the Pacific Northwest, which was published over time with the last volume, which I think was volume one, coming out in 1968. The last printing, final printing of the, um, of the original Flora of the Pacific Northwest, I think came out in 1973 or maybe 1976. So you can see leaping ahead to 2018, it's a, was a massive undertaking and really an amazing thing. So just a couple of tips on keying if you, um, if you take the plunge. One is that, um, of course, that there's a huge amount of, of jargon as well as a huge amount of um, abbreviation. So you need to get comfortable and familiar with that. You'll also want to watch out for wiggle words, things like often or usually or um, sometimes, things like that, rarely. Um, another hint is that uh, this is called a dichotomous key in that it has two leads. Whoops, let's go back here. It has two leads, so 1A and 1B, and before you make any decision, you need to read both 1A and 1B all the way through and see which one is the best fit. So if you were to decide 1B, then you would go on to 2A and 2B, and again, you would want to read the entire lead all the way through to make sure that you're making a good decision. Over time, I did find that people who had a really hard time keying were people who had a hard time making decisions. And I would just like to remind you that these are not very important decisions. These are decisions that you can roll back on. So it's not like getting married or having a baby or even buying a house. You just go, you say, well, you know, I'm getting further and further into an area here that just isn't, isn't fitting. So maybe we need to go back and reconsider our original choice to to be one one of these. Let's talk now about some strategies. In this case, the teacher is saying to the parents, "Our curriculum focuses less on rote memorization and more on putzing around." So you need to understand about yourself whether you're a rote memorization type of person. And, or a more of a putzing around type of person, or somewhere in between. You have to find what works for you. But I do have several suggestions about how to learn to um, And ob observation is really probably the key thing, if you'll excuse the, the pun. Um, so one is to use all your senses. We talked a lot about using your sense of vision with all those optical aids. But I, can, I hardly can ever identify a plant just by looking at it. I want to taste it if it's edible, but not, of course, if I don't know what it is. But I want to smell it. I want to rub it between my fingers. Is it sticky? Does it have a particular smell to it? Sometimes a plant will even have a particular sound. So for example, if you stood in a grove of quaking aspen, you know that those have a very particular sound 
when the wind is blowing through them. Another way to learn to observe is to draw or to color. And I am not a very good drawing person. I don't draw very well. But the drawing is really not the point. Um, nothing will help you observe more closely than trying to uh, draw the outline or the what you're seeing. So as I say, the drawings can be terrible, but the drawing is not the point. The observation is the point. Another way is to color. Um, the uh, universe, the uh, excuse me, the Forest Service has a wonderful um, opportunity for you to download coloring pages that were put together by a Forest Service botanist named Carl Urban in our area. And uh, celebrating wildflowers was actually the precursor of Native Plant, Native Plant Appreciation Week, now Native Plant Appreciation Month. So you can download these and print them out. Um, and there's, you can color them however you want. There's also a, a, a identification key so that you can um, know that, for the example, these are white and these are green and these are sort of blackish. So it gives you the um, how to color something so that it would be botanically accurate. Another way to learn to observe is to really um, understand what you're reading. So say, going back to our Mahonia nervosa, and I will say Mahonia and Berberis have been duking it out ever since I have been a botanist. And currently Mahonia is the, the accepted name for this genus, and we shall see how long it lasts. Um, but so, do you know what this means? Is that, that it's erect, rhizomatous, evergreen? stiff branched? Do you know how tall approximately 60 centimeters is? What does it mean that it has leaves like holly and that the bark and wood are yellowish? So really understanding um, not just sight recognition, but what is it that you are truly seeing and how has that been captured in words in a field guide? Another op option would be to compare. So for example, you could take your field guide and you could compare it with another field guide, or in this case, with the floor of the Pacific Northwest. Um, how, what do they emphasize that's different? And then you might want to repeat it at different times of the year. So for example, you might see flowers or the fruit, in this case, the blueberries, or what happens to the leaves in the fall, or after the flowers poop out, what does it look like then? Another, another strategy is to do a plant analysis. So imagine the plant is lying here on Freud's sofa, and you're sitting here in the chair, you're stroking your chin, and you're saying, hmm, tell me more. Well, what I really mean by this is that um, how, how, how is that plant, what is the plant telling you? How are the flowers arranged? How many of its different parts does it have? How many sepals, petals? stamens, pistols? Are any of the parts fused together? What are its least characteristics and arrangements? You could make yourself a checklist and, and go through a number of different plants and compare how their flowers are arranged, how their sepals are organized, how many they have, are they fused or not? Another strategy would be to learn the language. So, if you're keying, try keying backwards so you really get all those words. Um, most of your field guides and the flora have glossaries, but they don't always have um, illustrations that go along with the glossaries. So you might want to invest in a, an illustrated glossary. This one's pretty old. You can see my mom's handwriting on it. I got it from her, Harrington and Jarrell. I believe it's still being published in some form or another. Um, this one, Harris and Harris, came out, I think, in the 90s, has some great illustrations and terms, and um, the, I'm sure there's others that are out there now, And uh, but sometimes if you're having trouble understanding a term, just knowing you can look at a picture really helps. And then one thing that was invaluable to me as an undergraduate was one of my TAs, my teaching assistants, told me about this book, Dictionary of Word Roots and Combining Forms so that I was able to start really getting familiar without having to take Latin or Greek 
get familiar with some of the roots of the words that started to occur again and again, and that's been invaluable over my career. Another strategy is to learn plant families. And again, unfortunately, it's probably the best way to do this is to work through them systematically in a course. Um, but there are other, other ways you can, can do it. One is to get some books and compare things. So um, these are probably out of date with modern, modern classification, but they're still very beautiful to look at. Um, and uh, but if you can take a class or take, go to some demonstrations and see the characteristics of a particular fa plant family, or just quiz yourself if you're in a if you're in a botanical garden or an arboretum. Most uh, most arboretums and um, plant botanical gardens aren't classified by plant family anymore, although they used to be in some cases. Um, because what do you know? Everything in a plant family doesn't need the same conditions. But um, it really helps to learn some plant families so that you can help narrow down what a particular plant is. Another strategy is to get to know the people. So in this case, here's that Thomas Nuttall who I was talking about earlier. And here's a book that Frederick Persch used, one of the first floras of North America, using, among other things, the, the specimens collected by Lewis and Clark. Um, if you can make an association with uh, the people, or just getting to know these personalities, I find that really helps me to, um, to understand a little bit more about a plant's nomenclatural history, if I, can, if I can tie it to a personality. Another example is to make an association. For example, this is the California poppy, Escholtia californica in bud. And uh, it has a, a fused sepal. There are two sepals here that are fused together in kind of this hat. And that always makes me think of Greta Garbo's hat in Ninochka. So thinking of an association like that can really help you remember something. Finally, if you want to Another strategy for learning is to keep a record. If you're keeping some kind of list, you want to annotate it. Where did you see this plant? Who were you with? What did they say about it? Um, what do you remember about it? How did it smell? Or if you're making drawings, keep them in a notebook and, and, and refer to them every now and then. Or another example would be to, t to make a shoebox herbarium. So these are just some examples of plants that I uh, little pieces of plant that I have scotch tape to three by five cards. And um, this is not, <laughs> this is not an archival herbarium specimen, which is a whole other topic for a whole other day. And uh, um, but it's just a piece of a common plant to help you remember what it is that you've seen and put it with a name. And in this case, you can put both the scientific name and the common name on your card. So that's what I have for you tonight. Um, you can follow me on the Washington Native Plant Society blog, Botanical Rambles, wnps.org slash blog. And uh, you can also contact me there, botanicalrambles at wnps.org. And we can take some questions now. Thank you, Sarah. I think you did the whole thing. Yeah, I think I did too. I kept expecting you to stop me, but since you didn't, I well, just kept on going. I, I, yeah. Anyway, you did awesome. <laughs> so there you are. <laughs> I hope it felt the same as it did the other day, but you did really yeah, good. Yeah, it was a, it's always easier to do something, you know, again, but yeah. Okay. So I, I think I remember to put in all the same anecdotes, but <laughs> yeah. So I'll do my edits and pet it together with the question and answers and get Elizabeth up here and all of that good stuff. And I'll get it posted. I don't know if all you right. can see where the other ones are and they're all they're they're not all up yet. I still have a couple other ones to work on and a couple permissions I'm waiting 
before before I post, but uh-huh. I love your humor. It's it's actually a really fun <laughs> a really fun oh, webinar. So um and, 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 you know, I thought some folks especially experienced botanists were gonna drop off and they did not. So I think everyone Yeah, was, no, I got I got I got some very nice feedback from uh, Van and Joan Frazee and Shelly Evans. Um, you know, I think they they all they are all old hands at, at even teaching plant identification. But you know, it's always interesting to hear how somebody else does it. So yeah, that's right. That's right. I thought it was just a really great approach. So well done. Um, and the Edus is gone. And oh, now very good. We are rolling into getting ready for Give Big the next two yeah. days. So keep your fingers crossed. We have a thousand one thousand one hundred and one dollars this morning so far. So okay, it'd be nice if we hit our 10. So, what I'm going to do is connect with our social media people and tell them all to post and yeah, they usually yeah. do in follow up to the e-news anyway but yeah so and i think the letter is mailing today from oh wow okay the printer so i i haven't seen that announcement yet from them but she said may 4th or 5th so Hopefully uh -huh. that goes out today and everybody has that in hand by Friday. So that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which and then we'll have to start get some some uh, data as to how how all of this uh, coronavirus uncertainty is affecting people and their pocketbooks a little bit. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Here, it this is going to be the. The place where it hits the road and you know some of the folks that have already designated give big gifts are um, prior give big donors so and they're they're not smaller donations than in previous years so we'll see what happens yeah 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 so um so now you can send me a bill for a whole bunch of yes, stuff. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You'll be hearing from me. Okay, good. <laughs> Very good. And um, All right. and again, if you as you're working on that PCA piece, uh, Elizabeth's working on sort of the story of what happened with MPAM. So do rely on some of the stuff she's pulling together. Okay, great. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you have, I mean, I can look for it, but do you have um, like a link or the newsletter that PCA has? Um, I mean, what they produce? I could show you one of their emails that they sent out. It's all electronic. Um, okay. Well, I can, I'll track it down then. Yeah, it's a listserv thing. And, okay. Uh, actually, I think. Van forwarded it and I sent it to you. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, take a look at that Alrighty. first. Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll do. All right. I'll shoot you an email okay. when I get this thing done and post it. Thanks so much for All right. bearing with my my blunder. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome. Uh, and uh yeah so what what you, what what webinars have you got lined up for may well it's probably in the e-news it's in the e-news um we have david giblin on the 7th that's the next one and then we have uh, paul talbert is going to be speaking on his new book the hundred 